Thank you, Jonathan, <coughs> for those kind words. They are better than the uh, press release, and they are much more uh, appreciated. I just want to join Weishon in uh, expressing my appreciation as well uh, to IDC and to the ICT for yet another uh, inspiring and memorable uh, conference and set of exchanges. Dean, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to participate in the common cause which brings us together, which I take to be the struggle against hate, against terrorism, against the slaughter of innocence, which is represented here in terms of one of the victims uh, of the Yazdis in Mirzia Denaya's presence here at uh, this uh, conference. And all this as part of the larger struggle for international justice, for human dignity, and for peace. In this context, I want to share with you some thoughts, some feelings, some reflections, and some hopes about the Jewish condition and the human condition, about assaults on Jews and assaults on human rights, about the state of Jews in the world today and the state of the world as inhabited by Jews. The whole through the looking glass of a developing, globalizing anti-Semitism on the one hand, and an internationalizing terrorism on the other, which, I may say, reached a tipping point of sorts during this summer of 2014 in the Hamas terrorist war of attrition against Israel and the Jews. Indeed, we meet at a critical moment in this struggle, in the toxic convergence of the advocacy of the most horrific of crimes, whose name we should even shudder to mention, namely genocide, embedded in the most enduring of hatreds, namely anti-Semitism, and finding expression in globalizing international terrorism, with the Iranian regime as the leading state sponsor of that international terrorism, as we've heard in earlier statements, and Hamas and Hezbollah as its terrorist proxies. And I can do no better than to just reference uh, President Uri Reichman's brilliant synthesis uh, yesterday of Hamas, its ideology, and its actions. As it happened, the 21st century began, though it not only is forgotten now, but was not even acknowledged then. But the 21st century began, early days of the year 2000, with a statement by the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, that the, there can be no resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict without the annihilation of the Jewish people. Not Israel, he said. Not the annihilation of the Jewish people. And later that year, in another statement that went unacknowledged as let alone unaddressed, that this cancerous tumor must be uprooted from the region. I might add parenthetically that similar statements have been made during this terrorist Hamas war by the Iranian leadership, and they equally have gone unacknowledged and unaddressed. That was followed in the year, beginning at the end of the year 2000, and for four years thereafter, again as Professor Rachman referenced, with murderous suicide bombings. We also had in 2001 the infamous Durban conference where an international conference intended to be a conference against racism turned into a racist conference against Israel and the Jews. And two days after the Durban conference 
ended. And I was at the Durban conference. And as I landed back in Montreal that morning from South Africa, there was 9-11. As one of my colleagues put it, if 9-11 was the Kristallnacht of terror, then Durban was its Mein Kampf. And they were referring not simply to a process that culminated then, but really one that had begun decades earlier. For we have been witnessing for some time now an old, new, escalating, sophisticated, global, virulent, and even lethal anti-Semitism, developing incrementally, sometimes imperceptibly, often indulgently, but which now at the present time is reminiscent of the antecedents and atmospherics preceding the Second World War, indeed without parallel or precedent since. And one can state this as an empirical a statement, not simply as an anecdotal one, as I will uh, seek to show. The whole causing Nobel Peace Laureate and Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel, who is normally given to understatement, to say in the latter part of 2001, and I quote, may I share with you the feeling of urgency, if not emergency, that we believe anti-Semitism represents and calls for. I have not felt the way I feel now since 1945. I feel there are reasons for us to be concerned, even afraid. Now is the time to mobilize the efforts of all of humanity. And around the same time, my friend and colleague, the former Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden, Per Almark said, again in a statement that went largely unacknowledged, though it needed to be appreciated and internalized when he said, compared to most previous anti-Jewish outbreaks, this new anti-Semitism is often less directed against individual Jews. It is directed primarily against collective Jews, the state of Israel. And then such attacks, and we have been witnessing it in this summer of 2014, and then such attacks start a chain reaction of assaults on individual Jews and Jewish institutions. In the past, as he put it, the most dangerous anti-Semites were those who wanted to make the world Judenrein, free of Jews. Today, as Per Almark put it and concluded, the most dangerous anti-Semites might be those who want to make the world Judenstatrein, free of a Jewish state. And so may I summarize for you at this point some of the five main indicators of this old, new anti-Semitism, which underpinned the remarks of Elie Wiesel and Per Almark some 12 years ago, but which have only gained a currency and increasing validation since. The first indicator of this new anti-Semitism is what I would call genocidal anti-Semitism. These are not words that I would use lightly or easily. Indeed, I'm taking it straight out of the prohibition in the genocide convention against public and direct incitement to genocide. And as the Supreme Court of Canada held and concluded in a recent case, the Mugasera case, involving indictment of a Rwandan for incitement uh, to genocide in Rwanda, the court held that the very incitement constitutes the crime, whether or not acts of genocide follow. This was not only an important jurisprudential statement, but indeed, it's interesting here because Mugasera came to Canada in 1992 from Rwanda and applied for refugee status. When the court finally made its determination after a series of hearings 
into his refugee status claims and, and appellate reviews and the like. And his defense was, I wasn't even in Rwanda in 2004 when the genocide occurred. I came to Canada and applied for refugee status in 1992. And the court said, sorry, your incitement already in the years preceding to, leading up to, and making possible the genocide was itself inherently uh, the crime. And so, with respect to this genocidal anti-Semitism, there are very quickly four manifestations of it. The first is that which I referenced in terms of the uh, statements of the Iranian leadership, which cuts across the Iranian leadership. Ahmadinejad, the person many loved to hate and whom feel that it was associated only with him, should realize that before Ahmadinejad and after Ahmadinejad is the supreme Iranian leader Khamenei, who began, as I said, the 20th century and continued it with the call for the uprooting of this cancerous tumor, uh, Israel, from the region. This is second manifestation of this genocidal anti-Semitism are the covenants and charters, the declarations and statements of Hamas and Hezbollah, of Islamic Jihad, Al-Qaeda, and the like, which publicly call for the destruction of Israel and the killing of Jews wherever they may be, and the use of terrorist acts in furtherance of those objectives. The third manifestation of this genocidal anti-Semitism are the religious incitement in the mosques. I can quote to you, if time permitted, in mosques from Spain to Berlin and the like in Europe where calls this summer came out following a pattern, calls publicly for the extermination of the Jews where the imams have not yet been held accountable for these uh, genocidal uh, statements, which even led the <coughs> head of the German Jewish community, of German Central Council of Jews, Dieter Grohmann, to say, quote, these are the worst times since the Nazi era. On the streets, you hear things such as, the Jews should be gassed, the Jews should be burned. Those were not things heard only in Germany. They were heard in Paris. <coughs> they were heard in Sweden. They were heard elsewhere. The point being, a fourth manifestation has been the street anti-Semitism, the popular anti-Semitism, which followed from the elite-led anti-Semitism. To sum up this first indicator of anti-Semitism, as follows, that the state of Israel is the only state in the world today, and the Jewish people are the only people in the world today that are the standing targets of state-sanctioned incitement to hate and genocide, where Israel has become, as it were, the Salman Rushdie of the nations with a standing fatwa against its legitimacy and existence. Which leads me now to the second manifestation of this anti global anti-Semitism and related uh, terrorism. I'm referring here to the demonization of Israel and the Jewish people as constitutive of absolute evil. Through the ascription to Israel of all the major evils of the 20th century. And so it is then that Israel is characterized as a racist, apartheid, colonialist, imperialist, ethnic cleansing, child killing, genocidal state. And the ascription of being a genocidal state was never heard more often than it was heard during this Hamas war in the summer of 2014. Whether it came from Turkey's leader Erdogan, who not only accused Israel of systematic genocide, but in his words, not my barbarism worse than Hitler. 
And I can go on with regard to the ascription of genocide that emanated, as I said, from political leaders at the same time as it helped to induce those same calls in the streets. And so if Israel and the Jewish people are the only state and people in the world today that are the standing target of state-sanctioned incitement to hate and genocide. They are also the only state and the only people that are systematically accused themselves of perpetrating acts of genocide, which became particularly manifest, as I said, in the summer of 2014, which leads me to the third indicator. In fact, the first two validate the third. And the third is that of political anti-Semitism, which denies the legitimacy, if not the existence of the state, the right to exist of the state of Israel, as it denies also its people's, Jewish people's right to self-determination, if not also the very legitimacy of the Jews as a people. A principle and process that was captured best by Martin Luther King, who in speaking of this phenomenon of political anti-Semitism said, and I will quote from his statement as he put it then, it is the denial to the Jews of the same right, the right to self-determination that we accord to African nation and to all other peoples of the globe. In short, as Martin Luther King put it, it is anti-Semitism. Now, if these three manifestations of the old new anti-Semitism to which I referred are overt, public, clear, there are two other manifestations with which I close that are much more sophisticated and therefore, in that sense, more insidious. I'm referring now to the, and this is my fourth manifestation of the, the laundering of the delegitimization, the laundering of anti-Semitism under the rubric of the struggle against racism. Let's face it, the worst thing you can say in the world today is to accuse someone or some people of being a racist. The very label supplies the indictment. No further proof is required. And so you had at the time, let us not forget some 40 years ago, the Zionism is Racism Resolution, which the then US Ambassador to the United Nations, Daniel Moynihan, said, it gave the abomination of anti-Semitism the appearance of international legal sanction. In today's terms, that condemnation almost appears modest by comparison. Because there have been two other related indictments and laundering of those indictments under the struggle against racism. The first is that of the reference to Israel as an apartheid state. We may not appreciate the meaning of this reference, but those who use this reference know very well that apartheid is defined in international law as a crime against humanity. If you say that Israel is an apartheid state, what you are saying is that it is a crime against humanity. If it is a crime against humanity, it has no right to be. And I still recall that festival of hate daily in the streets of Durban. And I still can see in my mind's eye the chanting mobs in the streets of Durban, repeating day after day that the struggle against racism in the 20th century required the dismantling of South Africa as an apartheid state, and the struggle against racism in the 21st century requires the dismantling of Israel as an apartheid state. And so it's not just a normative indictment. It is an indictment with intended consequences. And if calling Israel an apartheid state is not enough, then you call it also a Nazi state. Therefore, not only must this apartheid state be dismantled, but there's an obligation on our part to see that it does not be. And therefore, all its supporters, particularly on the campus and elsewhere, are to be seen as collaborators and therefore silenced as part of this indictment of Israel's both an apartheid and Nazi state. And the final manifestation, and I see that my time is coming to a close, 
The final manifestation of this new anti-Semitism and related consequential terrorism is the laundering of this anti-Semitism under all the universal public values, under the protective cover of the United Nations, under the authority of international law, under the culture of human rights, in other words, under all the things that we all care about. And that's what makes it so serious and so insidious. And so what you find, and we will see it in a few weeks from now, beginning at the United Nations General Assembly, where for three months there will be some 20 resolutions of condemnation passed against the State of Israel, more than against the rest of the world combined. And it's not only this critical mass of condemnation. I've been there as a member of the Canadian delegation to the United Nations. I can tell you that what happens is not only a critical mass of condemnation, but a critical mass of exposure to that condemnation by all the members of all the delegations of all some 190 plus countries who are sitting there, journalists and academics and parliamentarians and diplomats and the like, who are exposed and come there, let's say, uninformed and the like, and internalized this kind of condemnation where Israel emerges as the meta human rights violator of our time. And let there be no mistake about it. In a world in which human rights has emerged for some time, and rightly so, as the new secular religion of our time, the systematic holding out an indictment of Israel as the meta human rights violator means that Israel emerges as the geopolitical antichrist of our time and hence the danger of the laundering of anti-Semitism under the rubric of all the public values uh, which we share. I wanted to make some reference because I did not want to leave it only with uh, these series of analysis of the anti-Semitism but some proposals as to what uh, can be done uh, about it. Uh, I'll leave that for uh, distribution. I've got a, an eight-point action plan, but I will uh, conclude with one point, uh, and it is this. When the case is made, and really the time has come uh, to move out of the docket, I'm speaking now in terms of Jews wherever they may be and those who uh, stand uh, in support, not just of a Jewish cause, but a cause which is to be seen as a just cause. To get out of the docket of the accused and the culture of the defendant and begin to emerge and act as a plaintiff, as an advocate, as a claimant for international justice. Because when this laundering of delegitimization, as one example, as I said, takes place, then what it does is that it diminishes all the things that we care about. Therefore, if we care about the integrity of the United Nations, we should be worried when it is laundered under the protective cover of the UN. If we care about the authority of international law, then we should be concerned when that is manipulated for these kinds of prejudicial purposes. If we care about the culture of human rights, then we should be concerned about the laundering of anti-Semitism under the culture of human rights, under the culture of the struggle against racism. And one particular thing that we should ask for, not only for disengagement, for demilitarization of Gaza, along with the coordinating and respective rehabilitation of Gaza on a human level. But we should also ask for the detoxification of Hamas hate. We should also seek the repeal of the Hamas charter. Let there be no mistake about it. The time has come, indeed, it is passed to sound the alarm. The situation of Israel and the Jewish people is really one resembling the proverbial canary in the mine shaft of evil. But I believe that in the long run, Netzach Yisrael lo that the search for justice and peace will prevail.